Welcome everyone to the Computational Sustainability Virtual Seminar Series. This virtual seminar series is organized by CompSusNet with support from the National Science Foundation and Cornell University. During the webinar, you can ask questions through the chat, which will be relayed to the speaker as time allows. Today's speaker is Dupin Kumar, who is a Regents Professor and holds the William Norris Chair in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota. His research interests include data mining, high performance computing, and their application in climate and ecosystems and healthcare. He is currently leading an NSF expedition project on understanding climate change using data science approaches. Uh, so now, Griffin, if you want to go ahead. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so this, this talk is about um, the opportunities uh, that arise in the, in the context of climate change and environmental sciences uh, for machine learning uh, and related fields, uh, given the very large data sets that are becoming available in this field and the challenges and opportunities they offer for our field to both make contributions to, to machine learning and computer science in general, but also to the climate sciences. So uh, like many other domains, the, the climate and environmental sciences are going through a revolution uh, uh, of data uh, going back about four decades when these first satellites went into space uh, to the more sophisticated computer models that generate the, that simulate the, the, the environment of the earth uh, on a global scale, like the one you see in the top uh, right corner. And as the computers get faster uh, and, the, and the satellite sensors get more and more sophisticated, uh, you have more and more data to the tune of literally tens of petabytes or hundreds of petabytes of data being generated every year. So this is truly a big data problem and is recognized as such by the climate science community, uh, which are sort of calling it to be a big science comparable in magnitude and complexity and importance to what human genomics has become already after about 30 years. Now, the same revolution happened in human genomics uh, starting about 30 years ago. And of course, our um, uh, field of computer science is sort of not new to this big data revelations. We can sort of consider this as the golden age of data science. It's already uh, the big data in, in all walks of life is really changing everything we do, the way we uh, connect to people, how we purchase things, pretty soon how we'll be driving, uh, transporting ourselves around, and so forth. So this is, a, this is a big, we are dealing with large data sets in many, many uh, different uh, contexts. But what is different about uh, the, the climate science or the earth sciences broadly is that this data happens to come, is, is the manifestation of, uh, of physical processes that are often observed at certain resolution and scale from different sensors uh, uh, that we use to, to, to view the data. They have a huge amount of variability in both space and time, uh, creating a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, and have all sorts of issues that go well beyond uh, many other uh, applications in which our community of machine learning and data mining has been applying these approaches to. So these are some of the issues that we have been dealing with in this NSF expedition project called Understanding Climate Change funded by NSF. And, and, and we're building a whole bunch of techniques. And this of course is a, a project spread over uh, five different universities, um, um, almost 50-50 split between computer scientists and machine learning and data mining communities uh, and high performance computing. And it has uh, many, many different sub projects that, uh, uh, that are sort of in progress. I'm just giving you a few highlights here. Uh, on the top left corner, you see uh, a project which sort of looks at the, uh, uh, the satellite altimetry data, the high data about the ocean to detect patterns that actually are the eddies in the ocean and which are extremely important uh, for people to study uh, from the ocean. Uh, the oceanographers uh, study these patterns very, very carefully. Uh, you can look at the, the uh, teleconnection patterns in the atmosphere by converting the, 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 um, uh, the global climate data into a network and then study it using techniques that are similar in nature to the one that you would use for studying social networks. And, and, and sort of the, the list sort of goes on, being able to build special predictive models, study the extremes, uh, novel methods for bringing physics and data together, we call them hybrid physics data model. Uh, but in this talk today, I'm gonna to talk about this, this 
thing about change detection, which is in the middle, uh, bottom middle section, while monitoring changes in the ecosystem. And I'm going to uh, talk about this in the context of data that's being collected from the satellite, uh, uh, which is, uh, and there are a whole bunch of satellites that sort of um, have been launched over, um, uh, over, uh, over many, many decades. But more recently, there have been plethora of exercise, uh, satellites that have been launched. Uh, and these collection of these satellites are able to watch the Earth, collect the information about the Earth at a level of detail uh, that has never been possible before. In the top left corner of the slide, you're seeing the animation of the MODIS instrument scanning the Earth. Uh, it's about uh, two different satellites on NASA. And this instrument is able to take a picture of every single location on the Earth at least once every day. So, but it's a very coarse pixel, about a square kilometer is broken into about 16 uh, pixels. Uh, and, but the data is every day. And then using the data, you can sort of con construct mosaics of information for the entire day, uh, as you're seeing in the next, uh, um, in, the, in the top middle. And then or for any location, you can see what the information is at that pixel over a period of time, as you can see in the time series. Now, MODIS is just one instrument. Landsat goes back about 40 years. It's higher spatial resolution, but coarser so temporal resolution. And there are, are uh, other satellites like Sentinel from the Europeans, which are higher resolution. And, and some, some satellites from private companies go up as, as high as three meter resolution or sub meter resolution. So there's this collection of these satellites. They have unprecedented picture of the Earth. And the question is, given these massive amount of data sets of different resolution in space and time, what are the things that are possible? What are the environmental problems that one could try to address? And what interesting computer science research gets done in the context of addressing those challenges? So I'm gonna address this in the context of three case studies. Each one of them, I will talk only very briefly given the short duration of this talk. But I want to, for each one of them, I want to tell you what they are, why they're interesting, uh, and what is interesting from the computer science perspective, and, and hopefully give you a sense of what we're able to achieve uh, by advancing uh, machine learning methods. Although I won't be able to talk about the actual details on those machine learning methods, which you can get them from the papers. Some of them are cited here, and all of them are available from our website. So the first uh, case study is about being able to map uh, the fires in the forest on a global scale. Uh, especially in the tropical forests, which are very hard to monitor uh, given the current state of the art methodologies. And the question is, why should somebody be interested in it? And it turns out that the collective amount of carbon that goes up uh, into the atmosphere from the degradation and the, and the burnings of these forests is of the same order as the entire carbon emitted from, from the entire transportation sector that, con that contains all the cars and planes and ships and trains and everything. So this is a pretty massive uh, component of the uh, global carbon budget. And if you're able to save these forests from burning and degradation, we may be able to uh, make a big dent into the carbon budget in the sense that just by not burning these forests, we may be able to sort of uh, uh, balance uh, quite a bit of the carbon budget. So this is an extremely important problem. And very related to that is this problem of uh, being able to map the dynamics of plantations in tropical forests. As the population on this earth is growing, um, they've gone up uh, from about half a billion people about 150 years ago to about seven and a half billion people now, and we'll probably saturate at 10 or 15, uh, or 10 to 12 billion people uh, for the earth. The, the, the need for food uh, consumption is going up. And as a result, people are converting more and more of these forests into plantations for soybean, for sugarcane, for oil palm, and, 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 and things like that. And what you're seeing here on the right side, right middle, uh, is, is a beautiful oil palm plantation, which of course was placed in after converting a tropical forest. Uh, but a lot of this conversion from the tropical forest, of course, is done by burning, which is of course a part one. Uh, and once these um, uh, plantations are built, then we, all over the people, people all over the world consume uh, products coming out of them. And, and given the sensitivity and given the need for us to preserve these tropical forests, uh, some of the largest corporations in the world have committed not to be able to, not to source any product 
that are coming from deforested land, especially in recent times. But the big challenge is that uh, it's, it's, it's hard to figure out whether the plantation that you are sourcing product from is coming from a deforested land or, or coming from a recently deforested land. And so that's a huge problem and, and to be able to you know, solve it and give, give actionable information to, to the, the corporations and the world community, we need to be able to figure out um, where these plantations are and, and, and when they were placed into action. And this is a somewhat hard problem simply because uh, the, um, uh, once the forests con are converted into plantation, they look very equally green as far as from, from, the, from the sky. So it's, it's not easy um, uh, to be able to, to figure out uh, from the satellite pictures whether you're looking at a, um, a plantation or a forest, especially if you're looking at a core scale image. So, so basically both of these, uh, uh, these problems are sort of related to the preserving of the forest and, 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 and managing them effectively. The third problem is about uh, being able to observe the, the water on the surface of Earth. And those of you who are living in, uh, on, on, the, on the southwest of the United States and on the, on the western coast of the United States, especially California, uh, would be aware of it a little bit more. But, but all over the world, the biggest impacts of climate change are going to be um, felt via water. Uh, as, as the climate is changing already in the last few decades, the, the water supplies or are, are the, the rainfall patterns are becoming erratic. We are seeing more drought. We are seeing higher frequency of drought and, and, and floods, and, and, and being able to sort of um, measure the amount of water on the earth, how it is changing because of the um, uh, climate patterns and because of human action, is a very very uh, uh, interesting uh, problem uh, from a number of perspectives. So each one of them are very interesting from a climate perspective. Each one of them happen to be very interesting from a machine learning perspective. So the very first problem of being able to map the global forest fire, on the face of it appears to be highly amenable to standard machine learning algorithms where you have the training data and you build a predictive model which could use the um, uh, classification model which could use the uh, multi-spectral data from the satellite to be able to figure out whether a certain pixel is burnt or not. Except that these fires, when they occur in tropical forests, are very hard to see uh, from the sky as they're burning because these fires create massive monoscope a smoke, and uh, often the areas may not be visible for, for, for many, many days, sometimes weeks or months. And by the time you get to see them uh, properly from the sky, uh, very often the, the grass would have grown up on, on, on the ground, and the area starts looking closer to being green than before. So, uh, so the area, the, the, the signatures are not as clear cut, especially in the tropical forest, and that makes it very hard to build predictive model because we don't have good quality training data. So we have to develop an entirely uh, new formulation which had to work in the absence of ground truth in the sense that it's a framework in which instead of having proper high quality data, we have some very, we have a surrogate data for labels, which is so different than the actual labels that you can't really use them um, in, in a very effective sense. And yet this methodology uh, would be able to build these classification machinery that can work with this very poor quality uh, labels that are available for every single pixel any, anywhere at any given time and convert them into some very, very high quality uh, um, data that, that can be used in, in, in practice. So this is a, a paradigm which um, uh, is of course applicable in many, many other situations, but got developed for this particular problem and, and, and I'm going to show you exactly how far we're able to um, use this paradigm to solve this problem of being able to map tropical forest uh, fires. The second one, as I mentioned, the, the big challenge there is that the, the forests look green and, the, and the, the plantations after they're placed look green and being able to um, uh, uh, figure out exactly how these tropical forests are being converted to plantation require uh, being able to map the entire temporal dynamics uh, of this phenomena, which is happening both in space and time. So see, so basically a kind of uh, deep neural networks had to be built to be able to do that. And, and I'll, I'll show you some results as to how effective they have been in building these plantation maps. And the, the, the third uh, case study, which, is, which I also want to talk about very briefly, uh, 
one could sort of say that this is one problem in which we have lots of training data because in, in February of 2000, NASA launched a special mission of the space to simply map water on the surface of the Earth. So all the shuttle did for a whole month is shoot radar beam down to the Earth and, and basically collect data, which was then used by, to process um, for, uh, for areas that looked like water. And, and, and uh, over a period of time, many, many groups around the world have sort of created some of these products and this data set as to how the Earth uh, surface water on the Earth looked like on February 2000 is available. It's not a perfect picture, but it's a pretty decent picture. And one would think that it provides a huge amount of training data uh, for people to use, but it turns out that the picture is only for one day of the Earth. There's so much has happened in the last um, uh, 18 years, 19 years, and how do you um, uh, know how the water has been changing? The surface water has been changing over, over, these, over these years. And using the data directly to build models doesn't work very well for a huge number of reasons, uh, primarily because of the heterogeneity in how the water looks at different spaces and different times, uh, and also number of quality issues with, with the satellite data. So each one of these bring in some very, very interesting issues uh, from machine learning perspective and being able to solve them uh, can, can, can really address uh, a societal problem in, in, in a big way. So I'm just going to talk about each one of them rather quickly. Uh, so the first one is about the being able to map the global forest fire. So as I mentioned earlier that if, if somebody gave me a training set in which they showed me pixels uh, and said this is not burned, which is negative and this is burned, which is positive, and for each of those pixels, if I knew the spectral signatures, the X, the XIs, the, the variables, then I can take this training data set and build a, a predictive a model, a classification model that I can use to classify any new pixels at any given time. Except that this problem has to be treated for our situation as, as if we don't have the labels. And the reason is we do have actually pretty good quality label for the state of California, uh, for Canada, both of these, the, the, Canada and California both keep a very good record uh, of their fires. The rest of the US does somewhat better, a good job, but not as good job as California and Canada. But for the rest of the world, the, the quality of data available for forest fires is, is very poor. And in particular for the tropics, uh, the Amazon, the Africa, and the Indonesia, it's really, really bad. And if you try to take a model that is learned using the data from California and then try to apply it even in Georgia or Florida or some other place in the US, the results are actually pretty bad, I mean, not, not very good. And once you take those models to, to the tropical forest, the results become really, really bad. So effectively, we have to treat this problem as if we don't have any labels. But as I mentioned earlier, we do want to be able to assume that we have some imperfect annotations of very poor quality, potentially very poor quality, but that are available for every sample, whether, you know, uh, and, and it turns out that that's an assumption that can be made for, for the tropical forest for the satellite data. Uh, and, and the reason we can make that assumption is because there are uh, certain kind of other signals that can serve as a surrogate, which are not very, very good quality. So the, the first challenge is being able to handle um, uh, the absence of high quality training data, but presence of only extremely poor quality data for, uh, for labels for every sample. The second problem that, that occurs um, that's, a, that's pretty challenging is that I, I may be able to build a classifier that has a very low false positive rate, and yet I may have an extremely poor performance. So imagine a situation where the, my, my total true positive rate is 99%, 0.99, which means um, uh, if I indeed looked at the burned areas, 99% of the time, I'll be able to identify them correctly. Only I'll be missing 1% uh, of, um, uh, 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 of the burned area. But on the unburned areas, I may make 1% error 1% of the time. That means one, per, one out of 100 times, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of look at a normal forest and call it uh, burned. Because of the huge amount of imbalance between the burned classes and unburned classes, even a very tiny amount of false positive rate can actually can create a very, very poor product in the sense that uh, if the, the ratio of uh, uh, burned area uh, in a year 
to the total area of the forest is only about 1%, this kind of product would create a 50-50, there's ha only half of the area that would be called burn would be, would be actually burned. So in a, in a highly imbalanced scenario, even a very low false positive rate can actually give you a very, very bad result from the perspective of precision and recall, which, which are really uh, the right measures to use in these situations. So that becomes, that, that makes the number of problem number one even harder uh, to solve. And the third problem, of course, is, is actually much more abstract. That is, if, um, if I know I don't have any uh, proper labels, uh, I, if I don't have any ground truth, and if I'm creating a framework, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm claiming to develop a product, then how do I evaluate the performance of this product, the model that has only very imperfect labels? And actually, this becomes a very, very challenging problem. And we had to solve all three of them um, uh, to be able to come up with a solution that I'm going to present to you, which, which, uh, which uh, provides you end-to-end -end solution. Uh, from a technical perspective, I won't be able to give you very much details, but then again, details are in, in the paper. So the first uh, uh, part is about, yeah, so, so going back to the fact that I have imperfect labels instead of the perfect labels. So just want to explain to you what I mean by that. So in a typical scenario, I will have a training data set, which is, you see the two tables on your screen, and the training data set you will have would be the one that you see on the left-hand side. There's your features, the spectral features uh, for any location, and uh, you will have labels, whether the location is burned or not. Blue, let's assume, is burned, and the red means it's not burned. Uh, blue is positive and red is negative. Instead of having the table on the left, I, what I have access to is the table on the right, in which some of the blue labels have been turned into red, and some of the red labels have been turned into blue. So alpha is the probability of flipping a blue label, and the beta is the probability of flipping a red label. And basically, if I had the left table, I would be in a standard scenario, but what I have is the right table, which is the difficult scenario. And the imperfect label um, uh, could be available in many, many situations. So for example, for the tropical forest, uh, the target label, of course, would be you know, something that you would know on the ground, whether something burnt or not. So the imperfect label could be thermal anomaly as observed from the satellite. That is, is, this, is, the, is the pixel looking warmer than usual on a certain time? Uh, and it could be, and if it is, Perhaps there is a fire there, and it could be anomalous for a num you know for reasons other than fire, which means there could be um, uh, negative. The reds could be considered as blue, or it could be not anomalous when there is a fire, which means blue could be red because by the time the the, the satellite came up on the pixel, the fire already, was already extinguished, or maybe it was occluded by smoke or some other reasons. So so these labels are imperfect. Some places they are much better quality than the others in. In, in California, because it's sunny and it's uh, the fires are, uh, are pretty pretty clear, not not as smoky as they are in tropical forests. Thermal anomaly signal is actually is not so bad. It's it's not very good, but it's not so bad. But in the tropical forest, it can have very very poor precision and recall just by itself. Similarly, for other problems like urban settlements, the the right label maybe is a place urban or not, and the nighttime light could be a surrogate uh, for the label. And then the list goes on. You can go into many many other situations where. You can think of um, a relevant target label and a potentially imperfect label. And this, if you, if you look at the bigger picture of where this problem uh, sits in the general paradigm of machine learning, um, supervised learning, uh, most of the time you're working the left-hand component of the street, the expert generated labels, where we do have labels, either plenty, in which case we use the textbook approaches, or not enough, in which case we use some advances and areas like semi-supervised learning, active learning, and so forth. But then the right branch refers to imperfect labels, which is the situation we are looking at. Even there, there's a lot of work that has been done in the context of multiple annotators. Uh, that is, if you have learning from the crowd, and you can't really trust any of the annotators in the crowd, but if you assume they're making mistakes, but the mistakes are unrelated, then there's a whole methodology that people have built uh, to, to work in that context. We, what the situation we have is the, is the right of the branch, which is single annotator, which is much harder. Even there, people have worked in situations where only one of the two alpha and beta is, is non-zero. That is, the alpha is, is, is non-zero, but beta is zero, which means one of the class labels can be trusted, the other one cannot be trusted. That's called partial supervision example, and a lot of work that has been done in that area, uh, and 
But what you're looking at is imperfection, both in the positive and the negative imperfect supervision. And within that context, some recent work has happened in which you're able to solve the problem for balanced classes, but what we have is a rare class. So this is a very difficult uh, scenario and, and uh, the solution is, is pretty involved, but would, would, would take easily about an hour long presentation to sort of go into technical details. So I'm gonna skip all of that just to sort of tell you that there is this multi-step framework of, of which the step number one solves this problem that I talked to you about on the previous slide. That is, instead of being, instead of working with a perfect label, I'm gonna work with the imperfect label in a real class scenario and try to build a model which will do just as well or nearly as well as it would do with the perfect label. Okay? And, and because I'm looking at the imbalanced class scenario, I'm gonna be able to, I have to look at the notion of precision and recall, or this which is also called user accuracy and producer accuracy in certain fields. And you're trying to optimize a product of these, that is you want to jointly optimize uh, these things. And, and even after I solve step one, even after I find a perfect classifier, which is as good as the one that I can build using imperfect labels, uh, as, as good as using perfect labels, my false positive rate may still be high enough that my product would be unusable, which is, which is where the step number two and three come into the picture, where um, without going to the further details, basically uh, we combine um, the predictions from the classification model and the perfect label to improve precision at some loss in recall, and then step three using the spatial context we try to improve recall. So this is the three-step framework. I'd like to show you how it works. In general, the only place to show uh, um, its, its uh, power would be if I had the ground truth. Otherwise, I won't be able to convince you whether uh, uh, we're able to do as good as the perfect labels. So, so I'm gonna show you results for the state of California for which we have the ground truth labels. So you can treat them as the truth, which, which is, if that was a product, it'll have 100% recall. If, if a classifier produced that product, it'll have 100% recall and 100% precision. So you're looking at this matrix, uh, this red uh, cross sitting at the top right corner uh, representing that thing. Now, if I use that data to build a model, it's not going to be a perfect, and the model actually turns out to be this. That it, it's, it has about 82% recall and about 40% precision. That means of the fires that it detects, only 40% are correct. And of the, and of the total fires, it, it collects about 85% of them. Now, instead, if I use a, a weak label, which is the active fire label, which by itself is only 90% recall and about 45% precision, and if I use this golden square, a golden uh, a cross, to build a model, that model sort of leads to this uh, golden triangle, and you can see that golden triangle is, is sitting not too far from the red triangle. So this is step one in action. That is, the imperfect label can train a model, which is not too different than the perfect label one. When the step two comes into the picture, I can substantially improve the precision with some loss in recall. When step three comes into the picture, I can actually recover more than the recall uh, that I had before and, 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 and actually have much, much higher precision. This, this sort of tells you that in a setting that you know everything about the problem, how this paradigm works. And of course, it can be shown to work in many, many of the situations where we have ground truth of some nature over here. This is the state of Georgia and this is the state of Montana. But again, this is, this is not the place where um, uh, the result would be of interest to the earth scientist. And the greatest interest is, is the place like in the tropical forest. And what you're seeing here is the, the red circle, which sort of is the, the data produced, the, the product produced about the forest fire on a global scale. And it turns out to be about three times as big as what is produced by the, the state-of-the-art NASA's product. Uh, and, and which means that it's finding, it's claiming to identify a whole bunch of areas that are burned that were not known to people before in this tropical forest. And we had to go through uh, a huge uh, systematic evaluation process before this work was published in a remote sensing journal uh, cited at the bottom of the slide, uh, which basically looked at a very thorough um, sampling methodology uh, to, to to convince the reviewer that yes, what we are producing is actually very, very high quality. 
and much higher quality than this produced by the NASA's product. But to give you a visual sense of, of how good the product is, I'd like to show you these three pictures from the Google app. The leftmost picture is from 2002. Uh, it's completely green except from few white patches, which are the deforested land. Then the same picture from 2015, where you can see many more um, white patches, and all of them are deforestation. And the rightmost picture is showing you simply the locations that were considered burned by our product. And the two different colors, yellow and red, and the yellow were discovered by our algorithm, and red were discovered by our algorithm, and also by the NASA state-of-the-art product. And if you look at the, the middle picture on the right picture, you can see every single feature in the middle picture connected to the, the picture on the right, which means which also tells you the deforestation story. That is, people will go to this forest, clear the areas by our burning, and of course, then convert them into plantations. Plantations are visible from the sky in the middle image, and the burning is, is, is captured in the right picture, where we also capture exactly when the burns would happen and, and so forth. So this is a very, very detailed account of the history of deforestation in any of these uh, tropical area. And again, since you have done it for the entire tropics, it can actually be used for many, many applications, including the one for plantation dynamics that I briefly mentioned. Now, because of the problem, uh, interest, commercial interest in this problem, uh, the, the um, a whole bunch of different organizations have come up uh, to build a product that tells you what the plantations, where the plantations are. So for example, in the top left corner, there is a map here produced by one of the nonprofit corporations called Transparent World, which is showing you all of those red pixels where they think are the plantations. And they, this is the product they produced in 2014. And it turns out that only less than half of these red points are actually plantations. And, and others are not. Uh, and that, that you can tell by very careful manual sampling based evaluation. And there's another organization called um, uh, RSPO, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, and they created three maps, one for 2001, one for 2005, and one for 2009. Each of these maps are much better quality, but they are very incomplete. Some places, they only cover about 20% of the plantation. Some places, they cover about 50%, but they're very, very incomplete. And this organization is still in the process of producing a map for 2014, which is still not out yet, because they are all sort of done manually. It's a very a difficult problem because of heterogeneity and people doing it manually is very, very expensive and, and not complete. What I'm going to show you now is the result of this deep neural learning algorithm, which is, of course, described in a series of papers and from our group, which is showing you for almost the entire uh, Southeast Asia for different modest styles. Uh, in red color, it's showing you the map of plantation that existed in 2001. And the green areas are sort of growing each year. Like you, you see the number is 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And of course, you go back to 1. And then you can see the growth. So basically, for any area uh, in, in this place, you can sort of map actually this growth of this plantation. Now, of course, so, so you know which area, which tropical forest got converted into plantation in which year. So this is one very actionable information uh, for anybody who wants to sort of use this information to source product only from those which are not deforested recently. But combining this product with the previous work that we ju I just talked about, we can do something more. And let me tell you what that is. That is, I can tell you which of these plantation areas were converted from forest to plantation after burning and which were converted after cutting the trees and removing them and then putting a plantation, which, is, which of course would be the more sustainable way. Okay. So if you look at this map here, it's showing you all of the areas that were converted into plantation between 2001 and 2014 in this part of the world, in, in Indonesia. Now I'm going to click on this picture. Some of these pixels are going to turn red, and the red pixels, some of the, some of the green pixels became red. And the red pixels are the ones that were actually burned, in the sense, as opposed to being converted into, uh, for, for conversion into plantation. You can see in this picture there are certain areas that are completely green. That means those are the people who converted their plantation into the forest into plantation by without without fires but a lot of the other ones were actually converted by a fire but when you burn a forest to convert it into plantation the forest fire doesn't stop at the boundary so there's a lot of collateral damage and then using our product you can find what the collateral damage is and that you're going to see that in the blue color and you can see there are 
whole bunch of areas here where the red color is very small and the blue area is, is just surrounding it very large. So you can see that to, to build a small plantation, somebody ended up building a huge uh, fire around it and burning a lot of forest. So you can actually measure a lot of these, uh, um, uh, a lot of these things very, in a very quantitative fashion. Okay, so now let me just finish up very quickly the, 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 the third component of my uh, presentation, which is being able to map the surface water on the earth. And as I mentioned to you earlier, we already have uh, um, uh, a lot of ground truths uh, for this from the, from the shuttle, but, but the problem is hard because of the heterogeneity in both space and time. The top uh, three pictures um, uh, uh, are showing you the, the, comp the false color composites of the lakes, um, uh, three, three different lakes in Africa, and you can see the colors look very different, which means the nature of their spectral signature for land and water is very, very different. And the bottom two pictures are showing the same lake at two different times, which shows you that the, uh, the lake can be very heterogeneous at two different times as well. But this is only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is missing data and poor quality data that we can give you, even though it's not missing, but you may think it's, it's there, but it's actually really, really poor quality. So in this picture that you're seeing on the right side, which is coming from a, for the lake, Poyang Lake in, uh, next to Beijing, every time you see this reddish color, red color, the data is completely missing. And as you can see in this picture, the picture is red most of the time, which means if you try to apply any standard algorithms on this one, uh, you have very, very poor performance. And then these challenges, of course, got handled by a series of uh, techniques, some of them handling the heterogeneity, but a series of techniques looking at the physical properties of this lake, that is water exists in a cavity, and, and, and even though I may not understand, uh, uh, I may not know exactly what the elevation of different locations on the earth is, but there is a elevation structure that's inherent which guarantees that a, a higher elevation cannot be water when the lower elevation is land in, 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 a, in, a, in a water body. So using this concept in a very implicit way, a series of papers, a series of techniques were developed to be able to build this product, which now can look at the dynamics of the surface water on a global scale. Now, without telling you anything more about this, I'd like to show you is this product, which is available to anyone anywhere on the, uh, on the globe from this link that you can see in, in the slide, z.human.edu slash monitoring water. And if you go to this link, you will be able to see the dynamics of all major surface water bodies that are more than 10 modus pixel, which is about more than about two and a half square kilometer. There are literally tens of thousands of water bodies. What you're seeing is the circles, the blue circles in the South America alone. And uh, in the next five minutes, I'm going to try to show you uh, the ability to use this uh, system to be able to find uh, melting of the glacial lakes in, in Tibet uh, for river that feed about 2 billion people on the earth, changes in the river morphology around the world, constructions of reservoirs around the world, uh, and all sorts of other phenomena that is very, very hard to study. And typically people would study one piece at a time uh, and one, uh, one region at a time and one topic at a time. So if you enter this um, um, uh, location in this website, you will, uh, and you click on certain region of the earth, these blue dots would start showing up, which represent these water bodies. And if you look, one of these water bodies happened to be Don Martin Dam in Mexico. Uh, the system will also give you the size of this water body at different times. The time is on the X dimension. The Y dimension is showing you the number of pixels. And four pixels make a square kilometer, so give you a sense of, uh, the size has changed. So this water body was about uh, 1,000 pixels, about 250 square kilometer at its peak, but sometimes it has shrunk to something very, very small and it has gone up and down. You can actually see the dynamics on an annual scale uh, looking at the Google time lapse, which is also available in the same viewer. Uh, wherever Google gives you for whatever duration, you'll be able to see this uh, Google time lapse image, which as you, if you notice this carefully, it's dancing, I mean, it's shrinking, and growing at the same rate as you see the picture below. You can color these pixels to represent growth or shrinking of water bodies. Growth here in this picture is being represented by red color and shrinking is represented by green color. So anytime you see a red color, it has a profile of the upper left curve. And anytime you see a green color, it has a profile of, uh, of a lower uh, left uh, curve. 
And now you can sort of look, already look at certain regions and say, well, how come there are so many greens in this region of uh, South America? And that whole entire area belongs to some agricultural land. And if you collectively look at all of the area of the water that shrank, it shrank from almost 10,000 pixels at its peak to something almost nothing. And you can click on any of those pixels and actually see this areas growing and shrinking from Google time lapse uh, in pretty much in the same form. And you can do that for any other pixel in this picture. You can go to other part of the world and you will see if you come to Tibet, you will find a whole bunch of red dots, which is the increasing, and of course, which is a phenomenon which is happening because of the glaciers are, are, are shrinking because of the uh, increasing temperature. But as the glaciers are melting, they end up, water ends up being trapped in these cavities in the mountains, uh, mountain lakes, and the lakes are growing. And you can see these lakes if you sort of, the system would also let you sort of actually look at the actual shrinkage and growth. And you can see here the black region represents the water uh, as it existed in 2000, and the red regions are the growth. And you can sort of look at different subregions uh, of the map. Of course, you'll be, you'll be zooming in. Uh, in, the, in the interface yourself. And then time lapse will sort of show you these, these things, uh, the actual dynamics uh, 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 on the fly for all of these um, areas. And collectively, you can figure out that almost 20,000 square kilometers of water or 20,000 pixels of water, which is about 5,000 square kilometer of water, just showed up on, 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 in this part of Tibet, um, just on the melting glacier. Now, before this product, people would be studying each of these little regions one at a time, maybe one Landsat tile at a time, and they'll have a product for one year, like 1990 or 2010, uh, trying to see exactly what, it, what the, the shape of the water is. Here, we can do that pretty much dynamically all over the globe. You can see the rivers uh, meandering all over the globe. Uh, you can, uh, 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 actually this work started um, in the process of studying one of the lakes, River Yokoyali, and looking at its um, um, uh, river meandering, and then in the process of building a product for that, we ended up building for the whole product. And you can sort of see, you can, many, anytime you see red and green dots next to each other, it's usually because of these river, river sort, of sort of changing shape, and they are changing shape because of a lot of sediments being uh, deposited from the deforested lands. So there's a lot of uh, uh, interconnection there uh, between the sustainable development and, and the nature of these rivers. You can also see the, the sea level rise in some places. You can see this uh, little island off the coast of uh, South America, uh, and this little blue sliver is sort of showing you the area where the, the ocean level has risen, uh, or the more, more water has come up. And you can see that from the, the time-lapse image that indeed uh, this island is shrinking from, from the east side. Uh, you can also use the same methodology to find out the dams being built around the world. Uh, because when the dams get built, the water, the region goes up from land suddenly to lots of water. Uh, and as a result, you can sort of construct a, a map of all the dams that have been built around the world. So, and dams are something that the hydrology community studies quite extensively. So they built a database called GRAN, which sort of tells you the global, uh, it is stands for Global Reservoir Dam Database. And this dam database is fairly complete until about 2000, but since 1999, they are relying upon people to self-report as to where the new dams are. And this is the number of dams that people have reported in this database since 2001. And this is how many our product was able to find. Far, far many more, even though we're looking at only some of the very largest dams. Just to um, uh, talk about this one more topic before I finish, uh, it turns out that even though so far I have told you only the ability to produce maps at coarse resolution, at, at modest resolution, 250 meter or 500 meter on a global scale, it turns out that for many applications, it's much better to be able to have much finer resolution uh, maps, but those data sets are available very infrequently. And uh, by using some very sophisticated techniques that resemble uh, the notion of um, uh, super resolution, uh, image super resolution, we can take a map that's originally constructed for a lake like this, which is at modest scale, which you can see is very coarse, and the underlying map shows you that this modest scale map is very jagged. Uh, you can see the water underneath and the land uh, as white and water is blue, and the map created by modest is very jagged, and using these very special techniques, we can actually make this very, very precise maps. And uh, 
So going from the left to right map, this is a very special methodology which sort of does this uh, computation both in space and time. Um, it, it sort of gives you the same flavor of being able to go from a coarse image to a fine image, which, which people sort of learn the mapping using a huge amount of training data. So I'm hoping that these three examples gave you a sense of uh, the interesting challenges that these three very important problems bring to machine learning and, 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 and some of the successes uh, that, that we can achieve by addressing those challenges in addressing these problems. And uh, many of these algorithms have this notion of being able to bring in something from the domain, something about the deep understanding of the theory, in which we, got, we call it theory-guided data science, to be able to sort of advance uh, 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 the discovery uh, processes. And these methods actually have applications far beyond some of these earth surface monitoring uh, applications that I have talked about. So with that, I'm gonna uh, thank you uh, for your attention and I'm gonna stop and take any questions. And I guess you can type your questions via chat. And I think some of you have the capability to ask questions directly uh, uh, via speaker. So uh, floor is yours. I'm gonna stop here and take any questions. We have a question from Sebastian. Uh, thank you for your great talk. I'm wondering if soil is more fertile after the plants of the region have been burned. In this case, how would one things in a more sustainable way? Are there are there plans to use these systems for political uh, or preventative action? Aha! Uh -huh. Very, very, very important. So, so, so the, the so the number of places. Um, uh, these products or these methods can can help with the preventive action. And I already mentioned to you in Indonesia, there is um, some of the world's biggest corporations have, have promised not to source product from the recently deforested land. And if they can put this plan into action, then it becomes less and less incentive for people to burn those areas because they won't be able to sell their products uh, more broadly. But, but to bring your question sort of to a bigger focus, I showed you the deforested land both in the Amazon and in the, in the Indonesian rainforest, Indonesia, Malaysia. It turns out that much of the forest in the middle part, which is Africa, is relatively untouched. It has been deforested, but not to the extent uh, that, um, that we have seen in South America and in Southeast Asia. And the population growth is expected to be the biggest in, in the continent of Africa. We are expecting to see about another two billion people in the next uh, few decades in Africa. And the, if, 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 this, if, the, if, if, the, if, the, if, if, if we start doing, if we continue to do business as usual, we will simply be cutting more forests in Africa and feeding more people. And which would be extremely unproductive way to feed these extra two billion people. And it turns out in Africa, there are, uh, if, if we do the right way, if we do it the right way, without doing any more deforestation in Africa, we should be able to feed not only the growing population of Africa, but even uh, population beyond, because there are a lot of productive places in Africa which can be used for cropland, which are not being used for cropland. There are a lot of places in Africa that are productive, but they're not being harvested or they're not being cultivated in a way that use the, the land very appropriately. So being able to use these technologies to figure out what are the productive areas, what are the forests, how do you save them, what, where the land is being cultivated? Is it, is it coming to the full level of yield that you expect from that land? Uh, for example, in the Midwest, uh, a typical farmer is able to get about 80 to 90% of the productivity of the land. Whereas in Africa, in many, many pieces of land, the productivity that is obtained is of the order of 10 to 15% of the peak. Okay? So, so both increasing the productivity and also making sure that only the most useful areas for productivity get harvested as opposed to cutting yet other region of forest and then converting them to uh, harvested land, uh, which is very, very unproductive. So all of this technology is sort of, is gonna have even bigger role to play in Africa and that's, that, that certainly happens to be one of our major interests going forward. Next question. Mm -hmm. Can these algorithms account for the satellite for the satellite instrument degradation over time? 
uh -huh. uh, which can cause artifact trend and, and variability. How does this influence the trend? Uh, oh, so the water monitoring in, in the end okay. So the so the satellite, um, the data collected from the satellite, of course, can change over time. If you look at the Landsat, um, it has had sort of many many generations, and each one sort of giving you know, signals that are of, of a different quality, and. So, so the heterogeneity is coming not just because of aging, but because of different instruments and because of different instruments having completely different resolutions and sometimes completely different sensors. So we have Landsat, we have MODIS, we have Sentinel, and Sentinel series of satellite has completely different sensors than, than the MODIS has. And then in, in, these three, of course, sensors give you a wall-to-wall -wall global coverage and, it's, and all, they're publicly available free of charge to anybody around the world. But there are many sources of, of data, like Digital Globe or Planet.org, uh, and which are uh, which actually are coll collecting data from a collection of satellites, uh, and and at, at, at even finer resolutions. So, so what you what you're looking at is a situation where you have data from multiple sensors, multiple modalities, and multiple qualities, and that makes the job of building machine learning algorithms actually very very interesting and very challenging. So, so these are all the challenges that we face in our, uh, um, uh, in our methods research and, and we have to sort of solve them before we uh, uh, get to the solution. Okay, I'm, I'm not, oh, yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions from the chatter question and answer. Uh, Tom, you have any? Uh, well, no, no, quite beautiful work, Pippin. It's just oh, so great. And thank, thank you, Tom. All right, well, thank you, Pippin. Uh, it's been a great talk. Uh, and this concludes the, the Contest Virtual Seminar. Hey, thank you. Bye bye.